Hello, my name is Martin, and this is a story that I wish never had to be told. If there was one thing in my life that I could go back and change, it would be that this day never happened. I was released from prison on June 28th of 2021 after serving 17 and a half years for DUI manslaughter. But before I go into the details of that fateful night, I'd like to back up a little bit and explain how I got to this point. Like many people, I began drinking at an early age. I was 14. Initially, I began to drink to overcome my shyness and to be more sociable. After my first encounter with alcohol, I loved it. It became my miracle drug that enabled me to come out of my shell and talk to people more freely, especially girls. But as time went on, I began to drink in isolation more and more because I was trying to mask some deep-seated insecurities that had started to manifest in my life. You see, I struggled with my identity and depression and had an overall sense of inadequacy. So instead of facing these challenges head on, it was much easier for me to drown my self-pity in a bottle of brandy. So that's what I did. By age 16, I was a full-blown alcoholic. I drank every morning before I went to school, during my lunch breaks, and after school. Alcohol was my best friend, until it wasn't. New Year's Eve of 2003 started off like any normal day. I traveled from my home in Vancouver, Washington to a warehouse that I worked at in Portland in the time. We had gotten off work early because of the holiday. And as we're clocking out and about to walk out the door, I can still hear my boss joke with us and say, now you guys go out and have a good time tonight, but don't let me wake up and see you on the front page. Of course, I laughed it off and I clocked out for the day. As you can see, however, I've never forgotten those prophetic words. So I left work at about 11.30 that morning and I headed straight to the liquor store where I bought a fifth of gin. I then proceeded to my parents' house to hang out with my twin brother because that's where he was living at the time. So I get to my parents' house and I hang out with my twin brother. I drink the alcohol. And then he and I had made plans for later that night to attend a friend's house party. Now, after I drank the fifth of gin, I then went back to the store where I bought four 24 ounce cans of beer. Now, if you're doing the quick math on that, that's 96 ounces of beer that I consumed between the hours of five and eight o'clock that night. And then my brother and I decided we would go to another friend's house in the meantime, because we didn't want to get to the party too early. So we get to that friend's house at about eight o'clock and the three of us hang out and we drink a pint of Hennessy together. It's now about 11 or 11.30 and we go to exit his apartment and I can still hear his mother admonish us and say, now y'all go out and have a good time tonight, but you be careful, you hear? In unison, we replied, yes, ma'am. We had no intentions of being careful that night. So we get to the party, we have fun, we drink more alcohol, of course, we bring in the new year. We exit the party, it's about 12.30 or so. I take my friend home without incident. I get back onto the freeway to take my brother home. And at this point, all I'm thinking is I can't wait to get him home because I still have another half hour or so to drive to my house in Vancouver and I'm exhausted. So I begin to elevate my speed on the freeway to about 80 miles an hour. Now this makes my brother a little nervous and he says, you know, you might want to slow down because the police are out heavily with the holiday and all. I thought that makes sense. So I went ahead and slowed down. We continue on the freeway for about 10 minutes. We take the Lloyd Center exit. We're now driving in a residential area. Again, I began to pick up my speed to about 60 miles an hour. Now this time he grows more impatient with me and he begins to yell, man, slow down before we crash. And I snap back at him, calm down. I know what I'm doing, I got this. Nonetheless, just to appease him, I slow down. So we continue to drive for about 10 minutes and we're getting ready to hit the intersection again, where I'm going to drop him off at our parents' house. And he suddenly realizes he's all out of cigarettes. So he says, Hey bro, let's go up to the mini mart up the road so I can get some cigarettes. I'm all out. I'm thinking, great. Here's one more stop that I don't want to have to make. 
So we continue to drive for a couple blocks. And then about two blocks from that point, there's another intersection. And the light is yellow. And I clearly know I am not going to make this light. But it didn't matter because in a split second, I had made up my mind, I'm going right through. So I immediately punched the gas and I'm almost tunnel vision looking straight forward. Boom. The impact shook the earth. And then everything seemed to go in slow motion as my car came to a slow winding halt. I can still feel the airbag envelop my face like a parachute is what it felt like. Simultaneously, a guy comes rushing up to the driver's side door frantically. Are you guys okay? Are you guys okay? Yeah, we're okay, I tell him. I step out of my vehicle. And my first thought was not to go check on the people I had just hit, but rather to assess the damage on my car. So I'm walking around my vehicle. I'm looking at my custom rims that are completely mangled. The entire front end is smashed inward and I'm devastated because I'm now looking at my prized possession in a heap of crumpled metal. And then my brother gets my attention. Hey bro, I think I see somebody over there lying down on the pavement, man, and it, it, it doesn't look like they're moving. Instantly, it dawns on me the magnitude of what I had just done. But before I had time to process anything, within seconds, lights and sirens were everywhere. So the policemen are on the scene and they're talking to me and they take my brother a few feet away to talk to him. About five minutes into that interview, that officer confirmed to me what I had intuitively known to be true, which was the person who was lying on the pavement had died. Another was being life flighted to Emmanuel Hospital just blocks away. So I'm placed under arrest, I'm put into the back of the cruiser and we head for downtown for processing. About 10 minutes into that ride, I can hear it come over the police radio that unbeknownst to me, there was another passenger who had been pronounced dead at the scene. There was one survivor. Now, as I stand here and recount the fateful events of that night, a part of me can't help but to speculate what these people may have been thinking about as they went about their day, obviously not knowing that their lives would be cut short by night's end. When they woke up that morning, what did they think about? Maybe how they were going to make an effort to spend more time with their kids and grandkids in the new year. Or perhaps something much more trivial like they needed to pick up eggs and milk because they were almost out. What did they think about an hour before the crash? Maybe how they had to get home because they had somewhere important to be the next morning. How about 10 minutes before the crash? Five minutes, one minute. You see, obviously, I don't know what these people were thinking about as they went about their day. But there is one thing that I can say with absolute certainty that never crossed their minds. And that is that they would not be alive to do the things they had planned on doing even the very next day. So the next morning, I exit my cell to go to the day room to make a phone call, talk to my family. The phones were full, so I took a seat in the TV area. And the news is on, and of course, the top story is the fatal collision. And I didn't want to watch it. So I kind of just leaned forward and I buried my head in my hands and I'm listening to it, but I'm not really listening to it. And I think the best way to describe what I was feeling in that moment was deja vu. Now, obviously, it wasn't because I had been in this predicament before. Rather, I was subconsciously recollecting the countless newspaper articles I had read over the years. The plethora of news coverage where I had seen this very thing had happened to so many people before me. And yet, in my tangled web of self-deceit, irrationality, and excuse making, I had actually managed to convince myself that that would never happen to me. That all those who had done this before me were simply lightweight drinkers who couldn't contain their alcohol, but not me. Because I was smarter than that. 
I was better than that. And believe me when I say, you never think it's going to happen to you until it does. Three days later, I'm in my cell and I'm just minding my own business. I noticed someone had slid the Oregonian newspaper underneath my door and I thought, that's strange. I didn't ask to see a paper. Nonetheless, I pick it up. I begin to thumb through it. I see my picture on the front page of the Metro section. And with each paragraph that I read that day, for the first time in days, my faceless victims became people. And these people had a story. And their story was they were recovering addicts who had turned their lives around and were now helping others get clean and sober. In fact, that very night, they were returning home from a clean and sober New Year's Eve party when they were struck and killed by a drunk driver. And the columnists had talked about the irony of that. And as awe-inspiring as it was to read about these people's amazing lives, it was what he said at the end of the article that changed my life forever. Quote, perhaps the person they will have ended up helping the most is the man who's charged with killing them. End quote. Now, I got to be honest with you. At the time, I'm only 24 years old. And I knew based on the law here in Oregon that I was looking at about 20 years in prison day for day. So I couldn't fully appreciate the value in what he had just said, but I knew it was profound. And so I became determined to figure out what those words were supposed to mean for my life. So for the next several months, I prayed about it. I meditated on that phrase, hearing it over and over and over in my head. And then it came to me. It did not come from some thunderous voice from the heavens. It was not revealed in some vivid dream, but rather in the firm conviction that the only way this situation will not be in vain is if I carry on their legacies. If I make it my life's mission to do everything I possibly can to ensure that something like this never happens again. So in that moment, that's exactly what I vowed to do. It's now time for sentencing. It's been almost a year. I'm escorted into the courtroom and it's packed. There's members from the media, there's members from the mad community, there's friends and family on both sides. I take a seat next to my attorney. He and the DA go through all the facts and formalities of the case. And then the judge announces it's time for victim impact statements. And the first person to speak that day was the lone survivor of the collision. He was a middle-aged man. He was very slender in build. I remember that. And all I was telling myself before he spoke was, Martin, make sure you look him in the eye when he speaks. You at least owe him that much. But as this man began to speak, I was so overcome with shame and guilt that I averted my gaze and I stared blankly at the table in front of me. And he proceeded to tell me, you have no idea what you have taken from me. You see, I just proposed to my fiance that night and hours later, she died in my arms. Due to the severity of my injuries, I can't even play catch with my nine-year-old son anymore. And you, you're just a young man. And when this is all over with, you're still going to have your whole life ahead of you. But me, I feel like mine is over. And quite frankly, I wish this judge would impose the maximum amount of time by law. Now, clearly this man was angry. He was devastated. And he was justified because he had every right to express everything that he did to me on that day because I made a choice that would change the course of his life forever. 
So when he got done speaking, I tried to mentally brace myself for the barrage of condemnation that I was sure was going to come my way from other speakers. Little did I know it was the exact opposite that was about to happen. The next person to speak was a 15 year old daughter of one of the victims. And she proceeded to tell me, Mr. Lockett, I forgive you. I know you didn't mean to do what you did that day. And a part of me feels sorry for your family because you're going to go away for a really long time. And they're going to miss you so much. And I encourage you to hug your mom every chance you get. Because you never know when it could be your last. She went on to tell me. My mom was my best friend. And now she will never see me graduate high school. She will never see me get married. She will never see me have kids. And when she got done speaking for the first time in almost a year, I had come to understand that I had taken away a lifetime of memories that will now never happen for one night of fun. So when everybody was done speaking, I stood up and I turned around and I addressed the courtroom with the following. My indictment says that I acted with extreme indifference toward the value of human life. But I can assure everyone here that my feelings have been anything but indifferent since the day this happened. And I know it's not much consolation. But I vow to spend the rest of my life doing everything that I possibly can to ensure that something like this never happens again. Now, normally, the day after we get sentenced, we pack up for the state intake center for processing. I did not. About 11.30 the next morning, the captain of the jail came into my dorm. He sat down next to me on my bunk. He said, Mr. Lockett, based on what you said in court yesterday, and now with the new year just a couple days away, we've received a couple phone calls from news agencies who want to come and interview you. They think you have something the public needs to hear. Are you willing to do the interviews? Absolutely. I did not hesitate. So a couple hours later, I do an on-camera interview with Channel 2 News. Shortly thereafter, Ken Body from Channel 6 came in. And we go into a small room, we do the interview, he's asking me a series of questions back and forth kind of about what my childhood was like and what led up to this incident. And then he says, okay, Mr. Lockett, now I want you to look directly into the camera. And with the new year just a couple days away, tell the people what they need to hear to be safe. So I will leave you with the same message I had then. If you know you're going to be out drinking, Make sure you have a plan in place for how you're going to get home before you do so. If you are with someone who has been drinking entirely too much and you know that they have no business driving, it is your responsibility to ensure that they don't. And I don't care how you have to do it. Wrestle them to the ground and take their keys, do it. They will thank you in the morning but do not end up like me and trade the next 17 and a half years of your life for one night of fun. Do not be the reason why a man has to watch his fiance die in his arms and do not ever be the reason why a 15 year old girl has to mourn the loss of her mother and best friend Thank you.